always love that. <laughs> I love that voice. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And we'll get started. So I'm Emily. I'm an organisational designer, a coach and a chronic illness advocate. I work mainly with um, purpose driven organisations like governments and charities and funders. And what I do is I use design and coaching to help people be more intentional about how they work and develop. So that's both people and the teams that they work in, um, how they work and how they develop both personally, but also relationally together as a team. The reason I do this is because I really care about building and iterating and building towards adaptive, regenerative organisations. So what I mean by that is organisations that can sense what's changing in the environment and adapt to it. So if I think about the pandemic or the climate crisis, we're really going to need um, organisations that can adapt and change and deliver really great products, services, communities, policies, whatever it might be that we need. Um, and organisations that are regenerative as well, that can play a part in healing us and healing society as well. I also really care about work being equitable and joyful for everybody. I say this as somebody with a disability, I have an energy limiting chronic illness um, that means that I get really fatigued. And actually what that means is that I can't, I can't actually work in an organization as an employee because of my energy needs, I need to work freelance. And I love working freelance, but I would love if there was a world where all organizations could be flexible and accommodate people with different needs like me. And I also care about all of this adaptive regenerative organizations, equitable, joyful work, because I really want us to have a caring society where there's mutual aid and mutual care and we all look after each other. So that's why I do what I do. Um, I'm going to talk about some heresies um, of organizational design, but I thought I might, it might be helpful to explain what I mean by a heresy first. So heresy comes from um, back in the day, uh, maybe about five, 600 years ago, if you said something that was against the teachings of the Catholic Church, um, you were a heretic. Now the word means it's a little bit more, um, the definition has changed and what it means now is an opinion that is profoundly at odds with what is generally accepted so if you say something heretical it just means that you're saying something that is um, what what generally um, generally society um, thinks isn't true or they think the opposite so the three heresies of all design that i'm going to talk about today number one the organizations cannot actually be designed the hierarchy is actually okay and that employee engagement is coercive. So the first heresy is that organizations cannot be designed, which might be an odd thing for an organizational designer to say. And I do often have angst about calling myself an organizational designer because organizations fundamentally cannot be designed in the way that we think and know of design currently. So I really like um, Jared Spool, who's a designer. I love his definition of design, which is design is the rendering of intent. So what that means is that, and as human-centered designers, a lot of you on the call, I know you will be, you'll know what I mean by this. You know, you set an intent, you have a, a plan and an outcome you're working towards. And rendering means that you make that happen. You take steps to, to make that intent happen in the world and make that change happen and, and to render the outcome that you want. Um, <laughs> In terms of organizations, that definition of design is problematic, I think. Um, when we think about organizational design, what you tend to see is things like this. So target operating models, these are like diagrams with flowcharts and they, their attempts to make the organization feel manageable and knowable. So taking the organization apart into KPIs or technology or processes, people management organizations, splitting it apart into different elements like a machine, you know, taking them apart, improving them, and putting them back together with the idea that we can improve the organization if we approach um, change this way um, through a kind of a more, uh, I suppose, traditional design, design led process. Um, the problem is, is that these are actually, these kinds of designs um, or processes are actually artifacts 
to soothe uncertainty because organizations are well certainly the organizations that I work with are complex adaptive systems and what this means is that we actually can't take them apart like a machine. We can't take all the elements of an organization apart, look at them individually and put them back together. A complex adaptive system is one where the interrelations and the relationships between all those elements are really complex and we can't, we can't really see them or ever fully know them. We also, you know, we can see effects happening. We can see outcomes. We can never really trace back in a linear way to understand exactly all of the factors that led to that outcome because complex adaptive systems hide those processes from us. That's just the nature of what they are. So I think Dave Snowden, who's a consultant and researcher puts this really well, that one can only really understand a complex system by interacting with it. So when we're thinking about org design, what that means is we can't take it apart like that diagram. In order to understand what's going on, we need to jump in and we need to get involved and we need to interact and try interventions. We can't step back and do like a big discovery process because the thing that we're trying to discover and understand and research is changing all the time by its very nature. So we in order to understand it, we've got to jump in and engage. I'm gonna give a quick example. So I worked with um, the Children's Society and shout out to Almas who I can see on the call. Um, and I was working with their senior leadership team and one of the things that they wanted to do was to improve their work-life balance. So rather than doing a big discovery to understand, okay, what are all the elements of work-life balance and how do we break that down and understand it? Actually, a work-life balance of a team is super complex, right? Because it's dependent on those individuals' lifestyles, maybe their caring responsibilities, their journey into work. This was pre-pandemic, so there wasn't much remote working. It's also dependent on big, complex societal factors like childcare policies, for example. Um, so rather than kind of take that apart and try and understand it, we just jumped in with some interventions to understand, okay, what's gonna actually shift? What practices are gonna work here? So we did a coaching program over six weeks um, and we tried out lots and lots and lots of little probes and interventions for adapting work-life balance and changing work-life balance and making it better during that time. And we didn't know what, was, what, what would work. Um, we didn't know what would get adopted, what would actually cause a better work-life balance to happen in that team. And something really did um, and it took off, but it was not what we expected at all. So I'll just read out this text. This is um, the kind of like signature text from an email. And it says, my working hours may not be the same as yours. It suits me to send this email now, but I do not expect a response or action outside of your own working hours. And this was a little probe, a prototype. So one of the team members put this note in their email signature. They didn't make a big deal out of it. They just were like, okay, I'm gonna try this out. Um, and it, it really took off. People saw, saw this little note and wanted to understand more and talk about it. It took off within the organization. Everyone started putting it in their emails. It went beyond the organization to leadership teams of other charities. And you know, one of the reasons that it that happened is partly because it's a very easy small action, right? It's not changing a whole massive policy. It's adapting some text in your email signature. But I think there was something there around the organization, it was like a signal, right, from the organization as, as it wanted to be in the future to the organization as it currently was. And that signal was around respecting each other's time, being autonomous, um, taking care with each other, having good boundaries and knowing what works for you might not be the same as what works for somebody else. So this is an example of something that kind of really took off and started to shift the culture within a team and within an organization around around work-life balance of what's acceptable and what 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 being a kind of grown up in the workplace and owning your own time look like and what we can expect from each other and what's reasonable so that's just an example of like a really small probe um, when we're thinking about and working in a complex system these kind of small probes are, are the way that we need to approach and we need to launch lots and lots and lots of them so i've talked about those kind of many safe to try probes i think another um way to work within a complex adaptive system and to practice organizational design or to, to make change happen is 
is reflective practice. This is something I encourage everyone I work with to do. So reflective practice can be on an individual level, which I would really recommend, but also you can do it as a group, you know, a retrospective. Many of you will be familiar with that. That's an example of reflective practice coming together to understand what's working well, what's not working so well. And the reason that this is really important is because if we reflect, we regularly um, take stock and understand how we're showing up in the workplace, what's working, what isn't working, what, what interventions are, and what's changing, what, what's sensing, what's, what's happening in the environment. And so this is a really important practice if you want to work with organizations as they actually are, that complex adaptive system, rather than organizations as we want them to be, um, or traditionally have seen them, which is that kind of mechanistic um, view. I think the third thing is around holding space. So this is, for me, this is about, you know, in facilitation or if you're leading a process to not rush to solutions, but hold, hold space for uncertainty for what is emerging to understand that actually sometimes the questions um, that you sit with and don't rush to answer are the most important thing. And this is a quote I love from Rufus Jones. He's a Quaker mystic. Um, I pin my hopes to quiet processes and small circles in which vital and transforming events take place. And the reason I love this is because when we're thinking about organizational design or change in a complex system, you can't do that top down target operating model approach that isn't going to, to make sustainable change happen. It really is those quiet processes, that reflective practice, or those small circles where you're coming together and trying lots of new things, and those small probes that I talked about. Those are the things that shift the needle because you know, organizational change is individual behavior change at scale, right? So these things are really, really important. A side note is um, Quakers were actually seen as heretics back in the day, so I like Rufus Jones has come into the heretic fold, which I like. The second heresy I'm going to talk about is that hierarchy is actually okay. Um, and what I mean by it's okay is that it's inevitable and we need to accept it. And so we need to change the way we talk about hierarchy and power within organizations. So um, this is from Joe Freeman, who's a feminist and political scientist. There is no such thing as a structuralist group. Any group of people that comes together for any length of time will inevitably structure itself in some fashion. Um, and I think we really need to accept this when we're working as organizational design practitioners or development or in HR, because um, there's been a trend over the past 10 years or so, which you all have heard and be aware of, and it might even have been something that was talked about in your own organizations around flat structures or um, non-hierarchical organizations. Um, and I think this is the wrong, the wrong question, the wrong thing to be focusing on, because what it does when a group says we're a flat organization or an unhierarchical organization, notice that it's very often people with positional power <laughs> um, at, the, at the sort of so-called top of an organization who tend to say that. Um, and what that means is it creates a kind of group think where saying the obvious, which is that actually some of us have more power, more influence, more money, more decision-making rights than others in this organization. That becomes kind of a taboo thing if you create this atmosphere of we don't have structure, we don't have hierarchy, um, everyone, everyone has the same, it's the same here. Um, so it kind of creates this, this inability to be truthful about actually what's going on. And that's really unhelpful because into that into that kind of vacuum and gap jumps all sorts of kind of weird power dynamics and discriminatory behaviors and practices when you can't talk about how power, how power is actually working in an organization. Um, so, you know, hierarchy is okay in the sense it's inevitable, but things that are not okay and that we, we all need to be working towards reducing or eliminating our coercion. So indirectly or directly forcing people to act in certain ways, disempowerment, um, and discrimination, obviously. So the kind of the conversation where I'd love the conversation to move towards is more about power literacy. So rather than saying we're not hierarchical, saying there are hierarchies because we're a group of humans and that's how groups of humans work, but um, we can talk about the power differentials and we can talk about who has power in which situations. We can talk about different kinds of leadership. So not only leadership that's positional, so the sort of traditional 
you know, um, pyramid of an organization with people at the top and people at the bottom in terms of pay and responsibility, but also people being able to take leadership over all different things in the organization, um, initiatives, outcomes, whatever it might be. So I'd love us to move to that place where we can be more honest and transparent about the power dynamics that are happening. Also moving towards more adult to adult relationships. And what I mean by that is that actually most of us are brought up um, from when we're a child and parent-child dynamics with our own parents or caregivers, but then through school and work, we maintain those parent-child dynamics. So that looks like, you know, in the child dynamic, permission seeking, not taking initiative, can I do this, not taking risks, etc. And in that parent dynamic, that looks like kind of quite coercive behaviors prescribing really tightly what people can do, micromanaging those kinds of things. And it is possible in a workplace to move to a more, a more adult to adult relationship where your peers and um, you relate to each other as kind of full autonomous kind of sovereign beings who can step into their creativity, exercise their, their good judgment and make things happen when they need to happen. Um, and I'd love for us to move more towards um, those kind of dynamics rather than talking about Oh, we don't have hierarchy here. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples. So um, David Marquette, uh, he's a, he, he was a uh, commander in the US Navy and he took over the worst performing submarine in the US Navy. Um, and everyone on the ship kept coming to him as the commander to say, can I do this? Can I do this? What should we do? What should we do? What should we do? And what he realized is that, you know, he'd been out of the action as a, as a senior leader for a really long time. And the, the people that knew what should be done were the people that were closest to the operations on the ship, not him. So he needed a way of devolving that power and giving that power away, that decision-making power to the people that were closest to the work. So he developed um, a little phrase that he used and it's, what do you intend to do? And so every time someone came to him asking permission or to say, what do you think we should do? he turned around and said to them, what do you intend to do? So he, he made it clear that the power and the autonomy for them to act lay with them, not with him. And so that's an example of him taking those parent-child permission-seeking dynamics and transferring them into a more adult-to-adult -adult relationship. And that simple phrase is really, really powerful. And you can start using it tomorrow. What do you intend to do the next time somebody comes to you to ask permission? Or if you are going to someone to ask permission, think about actually what do you intend to do is there something you can inform them about or get together their opinion or advice on rather than asking for permission to act i think another really useful practice is the advice process and this comes from um self-organized self-organizing um practice self-management practice so this is a way of making decisions um that is really transparent um and a very kind of adult to adult um and avoids that kind of consensus stasis that you often get with groups trying to make decisions. So the way that it works is you state your, if you want something to happen and you need people's input, feedback, you know, a group decision needs to be made about this. You state your intention. That often looks like creating a proposal, maybe even a written proposal, like half a page or something. This is what I think we should do. Then you go into a process of asking for feedback and advice. So everybody who's an expert on that thing that you wanna do, you wanna to talk to them. Everybody who's affected by that decision, you wanna to talk to them as well. And so you're in a process of really gathering feedback. You don't have to listen to everyone's feedback and take everyone's feedback on board, but you do need to ask people, what do you think about this? Then you decide, then you share the outcome, but only after you've gone through that advice process. So it's really clear who's been part of that decision and who hasn't. That's another process that you can start using tomorrow. It's, it's easy and can be quite transformational as well. The third heresy that I'm going to talk about is um, that employee engagement is coercive. So I started looking into employee engagement more deeply recently and because I was thinking, why, why is this, this thing that organizations are obsessed with? Um, and you know, there's constantly surveys um, to try and understand how engaged the workforce is. And I was kind of like, but why? Why do we want people to be engaged? And what does that mean? And what's this for? And the more I dug into it, um, 
I realized that actually employee engagement, the reason that companies are obsessed with it is because there's evidence or belief that it leads to discretionary effort and discretionary effort is sort of fancy words for going above and beyond, putting more energy and passion into your role than is required by your job description or perhaps even recognized by your pay. And that's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> because to me, that also sounds like a recipe for exploitation and burnout, you know, trying to create a workforce of people who go far above and beyond. And I think about this particularly in the context of where we're at with the moment with the pandemic. Um, you know, do we really need people to be going so far above and beyond? Is that reasonable? Um, should we be expecting this of our workforce? It, to me, it sounds like an idea that is rooted in some quite problematic um, concepts or, or outcomes or desired aims. Um, so I think it's not, of course, being into your job and finding your work meaningful is is great and we would love that for everybody you know I talked about joyful work at the beginning I do believe that um, but I think employee engagement might be something that has had its day and I wonder what could take its place or what practices we could adopt to move towards a place where work is joyful and organizations are regenerative and it's not coming from a place of extraction or exploitation so I think there's the number one thing when I work with teams um, is a lack of prioritization so people are like, oh, employees are not engaged and people are burning out. It's like, well, because you're all doing too much and you never stop doing things. So we're all completely addicted to starting things, right? Like new ideas are really fun and it feels great to start something new. It feels great to have an idea and to start progressing that and to bring people together around it. Um, it feels less good to say that project isn't working. We need to stop it or that's been a failure. Um, but this is essential. This is a muscle that we've all got to build in our organizations because, you know, what if you had a one in one out <laughs> policy with projects, right? Like if you want to start a new project, you've got to stop an old one um, because we're just doing too much. And then you end up with a bazillion different projects that are not managed effectively and aren't delivering what they should be doing um, and kind of strategic drift and all of that stuff. And also people who are, running uh, running around whose attention you know they can't do deep work like distracted by multiple different things so I think if we're thinking about how can work be kind of joyful or regenerative I think stopping doing things understanding that you know letting go is really really important how do we stop doing that um how do we kind of sunset or retire that project you know these are these are discussions that need to be had a lot more when teams have come together to talk about their work or their work in progress. There's also something for me really fundamental about designing respectful employee services. So, you know, if we're thinking about why are people not engaged or not enjoying their work, like a lot of the time it's because the services that or products that we have internally for our employees are so dreadful and, and woefully designed, right? So our policies as well. So, you know, rather than kind of free meditation apps with Headspace, like can we design really progressive parental leave policies or sickness leave policies, you know, that would allow people like me to, to be engaged <laughs> at work and in the workforce? Um, can we just design those things really well that take up and eat people's time and energy and kind of desire to, to, to be engaged and to do their work? So, you know, doing your expenses, you know, eat these things need to, they need to be as well designed as, as the care that we might put into products and services for, for users or for citizens as well. Um, and then I, you know, when I'm thinking about engagement or joyful work, I'm also thinking about equity and belonging. So again, like let's leave behind the free meditation apps, but really think about how power is working in the organization. Um, try to address discrimination to, to make it so that everybody feels that they belong in this workplace and that you can have more transparent conversations about, about power and equity. And diversity and inclusion as well. So I think those are some of the, you know, I don't know what should replace employee engagement, if anything, but I feel like these are some of the practices or conversations that might be helpful to have instead.
Okay, um, those were the three heresies. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Really very appreciated. We have several comments in the chat. And if it's fine for you, we can jump to the breakout room. Okay? Yeah, let's do let's do about maybe six minutes, six, seven minutes in the breakout. That would be great. Yeah. Do you want to ask people something specific to discuss in the breakout room? Is it or is it just a reflection about? I think just a reflection and you know what's resonated um, with you from what I've said, yeah. Okay, we will be directed very soon. Please, if you find yourself solo, just write in the chat and we will move you as possible as soon as possible. Okay, you can see people that are joining the set, the breakout rooms. Six people left. Sorry for the people left. I don't know why it's taking so long. It might be that um it says it's on it's on progress. Oh, okay. Sometimes people, you know um are busy or don't want to join and that's ah, okay yeah yeah i see totally fine yeah. yeah hi alex hi there was hi. nobody in the breakout room did oh. i just oh that's no, fine oh. sorry let me direct you uh did you let me try to do that or you can stay with us, Alex. Yeah. I'm I mean, happy to do that. Or you can just move me with the mouse. But uh, I no, love it, Emily. I thought that was brilliant. I talk about those and a couple of other heresies every day. So, yes. Oh, all good. Of them. good. Yes. Well, um, what, what are some other heresies that you talk about, Alex? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. <laughs> Well, you know, you might know my kind of, I don't know, somebody gave it to me. Apparently it's my tagline, the benevolent poker. So um, <laughs> I think I think in any, sorry, my partner's also on a call. So we're kind of trying to talk over each other. Um, I think there are just so many narratives and so many myths in any discipline and people just repeat them. And I don't think that they repeat them out of spite or to be, aligned I think a lot of times people just don't really think and they don't have the the space to think um so I I I I deal with most theories I mean I have that belief all models are wrong some are helpful yeah and it is about understanding when they are helpful context is everything I love what you said you know leadership style Leadership is contextual, uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes a leadership style that isn't focused on empathy is what you need because otherwise you would burn. Um, you know, um, so it's one thing. My other heresy is there's no strength and weaknesses mm. because you have. There's a beautiful French saying which I can't say because I don't speak French, but it is as a beware of the weakness of your strength. Mm which I love. So the point is that actually most of our amazing strengths to say, I am, I know that I'm super passionate. If I don't watch my passion, it can translate really quickly into bullying, you know, very delightful bullying, but still bullying. But we do not see this. This is amazing. Why don't we do that? And I'm very aware of that. I think the other thing that weakness happens is when you over um, use your strength without looking into the context. So passion is brilliant, but if passion is the answer to everything, it probably won't be helpful. It's the same, you know, when people say micromanaging is a weakness. It isn't. It is actually in some contexts, it's a strength. But if, if, if the answer to everything is micromanaging, it yeah. becomes disastrous. Does, does, so that's, yeah, 
but you know me, I kind of, this is why I don't write blogs because my problem is always, <laughs> I read a blog and there are parts that I love, but then there are parts where say it's actually made a little simple. It isn't, this is only one view. That is only one story. And I'm really struggling with that. So. <laughs> I am. Um, oh, hi, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Hey, Hello. Go. Good. Thanks for so you. I'm keeping my, keeping my camera up as uh, I'm just in the kitchen after yeah, the kids course. are going to bed. So, um, I was just intently listening to um, Alexandra's point. With the beware of the weakness of your strength. It's quite very true. Mm. Um, but I was just also reflecting. Yeah, it is situational leadership, isn't it? It's kind of just reflecting on some of the issues I got at the minute where. Um, we're trying to give adult to adult relationships and autonomy to more junior members of the team, but they just can't um, do that. Um, and they, they really struggle with certain things. And so um, you have to be a bit more kind of um, prescriptive, I suppose, in your instructions. And, and that's challenging, but I still took the point out that although yes, you might have the expertise or the experience uh, on the work, then you, but you can still give them autonomy or input into other or influence into other bits of the business. So actually kind of organizational decisions as opposed to project decisions. So that that's a really good takeaway for me. And I also agree with Alexandra about writing blogs. It's uh, I, <laughs> I think they're very simplistic. I like reading them, but um, I always think there's another side of the story. And whenever I've tried to do them, I, it ends up being war and peace. So <laughs> I gave up. <laughs> Yeah, I am. Um, it's interesting that I supported an agency to become more self-managing um, last year, and they wrote uh, Shift Design. They wrote you. You probably know them, Alex. Yeah, they wrote a really good um, blog post about that process and where they're at with it. And it's been fantastic and, and kind of liberatory. And people have really stepped into that responsibility. But they have found that it doesn't work well for for them for are juniors for people that are just starting out in their careers they haven't found a way to create that development that mentorship yeah. in a way that's consistent with the principles of radical autonomy um and i don't think they they're necessarily completely in conflict but it, it's, it's a really big shift for all of us to adopt and then what does develop career development look like i don't know if you have had that experience too jonathan yeah, it's, um, but again, it's, it's kind of, it, you can still say things, you can still say like, or give critique, but nicely, like it's, you don't have to be, um, and that's the bit I think we I always try to maintain, like it's, there's that kind of cruel to be kind and, and um, you know, it's good that we are critical of um, work and kind of providing examples, but there's, there's ways that you do that, that I think, um, can be done in that kind of adult to adult right way rather than it being demeaning and um, discouraging yeah so sorry if i interrupt you i need to call the people back yeah, while we can right. continue no, no. conversation that might be interesting yeah. for the others as well so yeah i just came in because my breakout room there was no one in it so it was just me. yeah oh. sorry because some people left so the number didn't match anymore so apologies for for inconvenient But sorry, yeah, Jonathan, I interrupted you. What, what, what are you saying about your experience? It was a natural pause. It was. Okay. <laughs> Just having a look at the chat. Mm -hmm. Like a throne we're closing. 18 seconds, 17. I also, I also think, Amelia, I love, I actually love that quote, and I'm going to use that, this idea about rendering. I think that is beautiful. And I think that um, often we underestimate the time delay between the intent to change and the intent to redesign something and how it is happening. And I would assume that shift is potentially also in that space at the moment in time. Mm -hmm. you know yeah and for me then it helps to think about 
another model and link it with it, like Bacana loops, you know, where you go, there is a dominant system. It will not just stop because actually that might create a vacuum that puts people in crisis. So to Jonathan's point of view, there might be a dominant, more traditional way of managing teams while the new system evolves and mm -hmm. both systems need to negotiate for a while to mm -hmm. keep people safe. Yeah, and also it will always be that way, right? It'll always be in flux. Exactly. Yeah. Welcome, welcome back, everyone. Yeah, welcome back, everyone. I messed with some of the breakout rooms, so we were having a chat here. And Emily, if you, yeah, if you want to say more about what we were discussing with Jonathan and Alexandra, or if someone has some questions that would like to ask to, to Emily, we are more than welcome to hear from you. Mm -hmm. How should people um, say, Laura? Should they put their hand up on Zoom? Or? Yeah, or yeah, hand, hand up, that would be great. Or if you prefer typing in the chat, that's, that, that would be perfect. Mm -hmm. I can see that the breakout room scared some people. <laughs> <laughs> Always the way. Yeah, but I understand it because sometimes I listen to podcasts while cooking, or uh, yeah. so it's difficult to take part in yeah. breakout rooms. Um, I wanted to invite Naheem to talk a little bit about um, what they put in the chat. Um, in my experience with one non hierarchical organization, inevitably hierarchies of experience and expertise. Um, but where you can make a difference is a quality of influence and in decision making transparency in organizational decisions. I love that. I wonder if Naheem, you might want to say a bit more. Hi. Uh, yeah, Hi. so I'm part of the health and care consultancy and we kind of operate in that way in that they we don't have a traditional flat structure in that sense, but obviously because of people having different levels of expertise within the field of healthcare, inevitably there will be um, people have different levels of experience but how we kind of work as an organization is that anyone like everything is transparent um, in terms of how the organization works and anyone can input and develop projects or processes or policies or input onto different elements of the organization so the organization grows as a um with the input of the employees as well so it's not something that's just left to someone at the top it's it's a very sort of linked up process and even with the smallest decisions for example everyone has a chance to input on those and i think having little things like that and i think in one of my other comments i mentioned it's about the keys treating people as people that naturally leads to more engagement and it leads to um people caring more about their work and being more engaged and caring more about the organization and having deeper connections to their colleagues and to the work that they're doing as a result of being treated in, in just um, as people and with kindness. And if you put that kindness at the heart of everything, it, it's overly simplistic to say, but a lot of other things can fall into place. Um, thank you, Naheem. I, just a follow-up question, if that's all right. I, I'm curious, um, you know, what, what's an example of how your organization treats people as, as people or, um, or brings that kindness into the everyday? I think, for example, um, so we have, uh, in the organizational meetings that we have, people can, people feel that they are able to input in in anything that's going on in the organization that's one element but also if um a really simple thing is if someone needs to take some time off in the middle of the day for example to pick their child up from school and that's okay as long as you let people know what's going on and you post it in the chat that's completely fine there's no one saying or you can't do that, I need you to work on this project and by this deadline you can't go anywhere. Whereas a lot of organizations feel that resistance from their managers or whatever when 
as something as simple as acknowledging people have other things going on in their lives and just um, uh, building in systems to account for that and just treating each other with, with kindness in that sense can make all the difference. Mm. It's about respect as well, isn't it, fundamentally? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or, or challenges um, to what I talked about? I have just a provocative question. Um, how do you think we can change the current situation into something more inclusive or regenerative, as you describe, in a, I don't know, very closed environment? How would you approach the situation? In a closed environment? Is that yeah, like, like mentally closed or a mm. particular uh, old school environment. Mm. What um, what do you mean by, like by mentally closed? Uh, I could I could maybe chip in there because we talked I talked about this with Sabine a little bit. So I do work with clients um, to think about organizational design and, and structure. And it can be very challenging to I mean, it feels like moving a mountain, right, particularly to a lot of um, leaders. And at the same time, so I'm on board with everything you have here, which maybe makes me a, a heretic, but it's also really hard to sell, you know, from a consultant standpoint or from even from an internal standpoint, it's really hard to sell incremental change. It's hard to sell nudging. It's hard to say, we're going to spend the next year, you know, sort of going through an iterative process where we consistently reflect on what we're doing and how well it's working. Um, it's much easier to sell, you're going to pay us $300,000 and we're going to give you a new org chart. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's very challenging from, a, from an implementation perspective. And that's paired with what I, what I think you were maybe reflecting on a little bit there, Laura, which from my perspective, we're really at the infancy of most leaders understanding that they have to be more open if they are going to be competitive in the future. I just don't think most organizations understand that. Um, you know, I, I think the leaders do. You know, the the very the very leaders. But for most companies, they look at a program like this and they see dollar signs. They don't see they don't see what the actual return on the investment. They don't see what the competitive um, edge is going to be in a year or five years. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is very insightful. And um, do you think it's right to summarize what you have just said in terms of? If the organization is not ready to change, it's probably hopeless. So maybe it needs a different maturity level to embrace all this. Uh, I don't know if it's hopeless. I think there's a lot of people, who, at least, in, so I'm in America, which is, I, I don't know how different it is, but I think at, le at least in America, there are a lot of people that like to think, leaders, I shouldn't, not just people, but leaders of organizations that like to think that they are invested in diversity and inclusion and in openness and in um, you know, having a more inclusive working environment. But that's, it's much more talk than it is walk. And when it comes down to actually making choices and investments, that's where it kind of falls apart. So you know, I think we're going to see a continuum where there are, you know, where people start to realign their actions to their thinking, but that that's still a long ways off. And I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to make it go any faster. <laughs> that's where I guess I feel hopeless. Like I don't, I don't know how to how to hustle that process along more um, than than I already am, which is not enough. That's why we need consultants like you and Emily. That, that's really <laughs> helpful. And I am, um, I I hear you, Katie. I it's difficult. Um, so, I mean, I, I tend to work in partnership maybe with only a few people and we don't do massive projects and I don't have salaries to pay. Um, so maybe I'm in a slightly different position, um, where I can be a little bit more, um, maybe selective or, or be more upfront about how I work because I don't need to. Um, bring in really massive projects to make sure that everyone gets paid um, but you know certainly until until about a year ago I 
I would I would be brought into organizations because people wanted a new target operating model. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of go, okay, I mean, maybe not quite like that, maybe a bit more like this, but it was a little bit kind of um Trojan horsey, I would say, <laughs> in the approach, which doesn't sit too well with me. You know, I prefer to be upfront about how I work and what I believe. Um, so that's what I do now. And then I the kinds of organizations that want to work that way are attracted to that but it it is really difficult because what you're saying is this is team by team work mm-hmm. you, know, you cannot do this at scale like instantly right. it's you know it's deep in a personal work on an individual level it's deep relational work among teams and then the ripple effects of that will ripple out in ways that you can't predict and I can't sell you those, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Um, yeah. yeah. So it it is it's really challenging talking about that this is generational work, mm-hmm. you know, this is decades. Um that doesn't sit well with kind of annual planning and <laughs> then the only other thing I'd throw out there is I mentioned it in the chat, but I don't know if you're familiar with Eleanor Ostrom. She's she's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And what this brings to mind is so her her central thesis is that resources are best managed by those who need the resource um so not from afar not from a governing body and what you know we're at a position in in industry where time is the central resource and we are not we and i say we in a very generalized sense but at least in america we do not leave the people who own the time to manage the time, um, you know that's that's up to other people, and that's you know that's a little bit of a of a different way of thinking about everything that you put there in your presentation in terms of you know sort of self governance mm. along with along with organizational change. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Amber's question in the chat. Um, on the advice process you covered, you mentioned that you don't have to take everyone's advice when deciding on an outcome. However, thinking about power dynamics, what is to prevent someone with a lot of privilege ignoring advice for someone with less privilege, consciously or unconsciously? That's a great question, Amber. Um, So there's something in the kind of structure of the advice process where when you're setting it out, you kind of, you all have to agree that, you have to agree the parameters of who you need to ask the advice from. So one of those parameters I think I mentioned was, you know, anyone who's affected by this decision, anyone who's got expertise in the area of this decision you know some people might want to set a parameter around um, thinking about who you're talking to in terms of whose voices are often ignored in the organization and maybe wanting to rebalance who you're talking to based on um, not just people with the loudest voices so there's that but I think you're right that there is a danger of um ignore of kind of when once you've done that advice and then going well I don't need to accept I don't need to take on board this feedback from this person um and I'm not sure there's a there is a structural um (laughs) or process a solution to that that's about the equity in the organization as a whole um and people themselves doing their own work to understand the dynamics that they're part of and who they are listening to and who they're not listening to so I, I don't think there's a solution but I think that's a really excellent question maybe to ask um, as part of the process you know be conscious of whose advice you're taking on board and whose advice you're disregarding perhaps thanks this is really inspiring reply um, Nahim had a question. Do you have buy-in from senior leaders before you work with them? Or do you have to work to create buy-in for this approach? If so, what's your approach to getting them on side? Um, I mean, Alex might have views on this too, but um, yes, I think you need a degree of buy-in, um, but I think it's very difficult and unfair to expect people who've never been part of working in this way to completely buy into it before they've seen it. So what what you need is is a mindset, like an openness, like an openness to challenge and openness to exploration an ability to exist in uncertainty to a degree in order to get started. 
Um, and then, you know, once you're going through that process of holding space and, and working with organizational change in a much more emergent way, once you've got, once you're going through that, then you're creating change as it happens and leaders can see that and the buy-in builds from there. Um, Alex, did you want to add to that? There is, um, there's a beautiful sentence in the coaching world, which is really hard for me for those who know me because I'm bloody opinionated. But um, it says meeting the system where it is at. And I think it's the hardest thing, which is actually going in deeply curious, non-judgmental, and really trying to meet the system where it is at. Even if that is incredibly hard, I think, to your point, Emily, because I can't expect. So it's like trust, right? It needs to be developed. I can't expect trust. I can't expect a safe space. I find it super interesting when I come into some facilitations where the facilitator, I've probably actually done it myself. I mean, sits there and says, now we have created this, this, this safe space. That's not for me to say. I can articulate the intent and I can say that I'm intending this, but I cannot demand a safe space. And it's hard, isn't it? Because it's a super balanced, but yeah, meeting the system where it is, is hard. Mm. Isn't it very inspiring? Because I've just noticed that I typed in the chat of the breakout rooms, this is a safe environment without putting the intent. So yeah, this is reflective. Thanks, Alison. Thank you. I see Naheem's um, brought that great quote in that change moves at the speed of trust. Yeah, I really agree with that. Um, I can see we've only got two minutes left. Laura, is there time for another question or do we want to wrap up? Yeah, if you want, we can pick another one from the chat. Uh, there was a, one uh, from Frank mm -hmm. that says, how would you suggest getting past the intent to be inclusive? to not just employees, but with the users, where they want versus implement gap exists? Yeah, this is, oh, this is a tough one. Katie, did you want to, to jump in there? I saw your hand up. No? Oh, maybe she was saying goodbye, I think. Um, hey, this is yeah. Frank. Hey, it's, it's, okay oh, hi, if you, it's okay if you don't answer, because I think the American woman that was speaking earlier pretty much uh, COVID. touched on it in terms of the inclusiveness and the organizational stuff but thank you I, I don't want to open up a huge thing because you're trying to wrap up but um it is a big one <laughs> and maybe <laughs> it's more just a reflective one in terms of you know uh, but thank you so much this has been lovely thank you frank great question as well thanks everyone really to be here tonight very appreciated